ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد brothers sisters in islam all viewers i'm imam sharif from finland and i greet everyone assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh all thanks and praise are due to allah i bear witness that he is the only one with no associate and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and messenger allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran ya ayuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqati wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun o you who believe fear allah the way he should be feared and never die unless in the state of islam allah says again o mankind fear your lord who created you from one soul and from that soul he created for him his partner and from the twain he created for them their offsprings so fear your lord from who you attain your sustenance and fear the womb that bore you because allah is watching over you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullaha wa qulu qawlan sadida O you who believe fear Allah and say good words and with that he purify your deeds and forgive you your sins. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inna asdaq al-hadithi kitab Allah. The best of words are the words of Allah, the book of Allah, and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he warned us against going astray that we should stick to the religion. It's enough for us to know the straight path for Allah. For anyone who should go astray would end up in the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us through our deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us also die on our Islam in the right way. Brothers, sisters in Islam, uh, today's topic is about the stages of life. The stages of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, has created us and he didn't abandon us instead. He sent unto us messengers and he sent unto us prophets. And also, he made us to understand what is day and night so that we can know between the right and the wrong. So he says, He has given us two type of path. The path to the truth, Anyone who wants to believe should believe. And anyone who wants to disbelieve can disbelieve. Allah says again, "What matter shall one in line yet shall Allah and you would never will unless by the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala." So we're talking about the stages of life when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala first created us. What we have to understand is that before coming into this life, we were in existence. We existed in a form where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had made the origin of man. In the, in the form of what we were created from. The clay, the sun, the mud, that was used in creating our father, Adam alayhi salam, and everything that actually formed part of the creation of man. So we were in existence. Anyone who is supposed to come into existence had already uh, been designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is going to come into this life. And when you are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, it's known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah alone. So the first stage of our lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Al-Quran, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ وَكُنْتُمْ amwata. How then do you disbelieve when ye were dead? Dead in the sense that you were not in existence, but you actually had uh, been planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you would come into existence. So that used to be the first stage of your existence in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you, the human being, would one day come into this world. And that stage, like we mentioned, you didn't exist here in this world, but you were actually in existence. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Tabarakalli bi yadihil mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Then he said, Alladhi khalakal mawta wal haya. Allah praising himself and then he said, the one who created death and life so he first began with the creation of death before the creation of life meaning that we were dead before meaning that we were in existence 
in the form of not having the soul attached to the body, that's when you are known as a dead person. So the second stage is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made us to come into this world through mother and father. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, when someone was talking about this quality, then he said, what is the quality of man when he was being created from two types of urine? A urine from the father and a urine from the mother. And that was the origin of man, meaning that that was how every human being came into this world. And we all know and understand the hadith or the words of, the, of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. This was how to humiliate himself to let people understand that you are nothing but only made of the two, and you shall actually go uh, return to Allah. So the first stage, as we mentioned, you were not in this world, and the second stage is when you were in your mother's womb. In a very tight corner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made you to remain in this very tight corner for an appointed time. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when Allah intends to create, and the man come into contact with the woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the sperm of the woman spread, sorry, of the man spread within the womb of the, of the mother. Then within a period of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then gather the sperm in one fixed place out of his will. And from there, he will create the human being. He will create a human being in stages. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned three types of stages. The stage of it being a clotted sperm, and then later on it turned into blood and the third stage it turned into lamb then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send on to this lamb an angel who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command to write threatens his span of life how long he's going to live in this world and his risk which is uh his world how much he's going to acquire in this world and then whether he's going to be a believer or an unbeliever, and the fourth is whether he's going to be a lucky or unlucky person. Well, in this hadith of the Muhammad وسلم, we have to understand one thing, that from the day you were created, it was already decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it had been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this day that you are going to come into this world, and that day you are going to leave the world. So it is already in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how long you're going to live in this world, but no one knows how long, not even the angel of death knows when you are going to leave the world. Then the second part of it is whether you be a believer or an unbeliever. The Prophet Sallallahu when he said this, one of the Sahaba, his companions said, then why should I struggle to make or to work? Uh, meaning that work my out of uh, having faith in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and pray when I know very well that in the end, where I'm supposed to go, which is known to Allah is where I'm going to go. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, you should work, and what had already been decreed will now come into a reality. In our out of your own choice that you should believe or not to believe, Allah had already mentioned that in the Quran. That anyone who wants to believe should believe, and anyone who doesn't want is up to him. Then in the end, Allah says, you never will unless by the will of Allah. So through your efforts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will confirm whether you are a believer or you want to be a believer or a non-believer. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then comes the I mean the, the writing of the uh, whether you are going to be a lucky or unlucky person. It is the creed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to make all these depending on his creation and whatever Allah wants, Allah can change at any time that he wills. Out of the day you're going to leave the world, Allah had already written it down. So all these are within ghaibiyat, the unseen, the unknown, knowledge that is only belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a woman is pregnant, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that she is in between life and death. So if she should die because of the pregnancy, then she dies a mitre. See how important it is when your mother had carried you for that period of nine months while you are in her stomach. Within all this period of time, your mother is suffering, carrying you day and night. While you grow, she is happy because you are growing in her stomach. Until one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then decide that you should now come into this world. Always we mention nine months. It depends on individually that Allah had already uh, mentioned. Few come before or after. In any case, uh, the agreed or accepted or the natural time 
or period is the nine months that is being mentioned, and we all know about that. <clears throat> so when, while your mother is pregnant and you are going to be born, there is within the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whereby the man had to take a very important role. The mother had already taken all this pay, and in the ninth month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless her with your coming out into this world. The first thing the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had made us to understand is that when the child is born, it is the right of the child that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should do the following. One, you should call the name of Allah in the ear of the child. It should be the first word that the child will hear is the mightiness of his creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why we make the adhan in the right ear when the child is born. Most of the time, some people will not do the azan or they will not call the azan immediately when the child is born. Uh, they would like to wait for a period of time, that means a period of one week, and after that they call a, an imam or a sheikh to come and do that for them. This used to be a local practice that long ago when Islam came newly to some parts of non-Islamic world, uh, this used to be the practice in the sense that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that uh, seven days after the birth of the child, he should be given a name, and if it's a boy, he has to be circumcised. Now they take this to that extent by making the same calling of adhan in the in the ear on that very day. But actually, what we are supposed to do as a father, the moment the child is born, especially uh, in Europe, what happens is that the child, the father usually is allowed to uh, be uh, in the room where the wife is going to give birth. So immediately the child is born, you the father, you take the child, they clean the child and they give the child to the father. So the father uh, holds the child and then what you are supposed to do is to call the adhan in his ear immediately. <clears throat> so you turn and then you call the adhan in the right ear of the child. You just hold the child uh, closer to you in this way. Don't worry, inshallah, by the will of Allah, he hear whatever you say. You don't have to draw so down. You can just hold the child this way, and then you start saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-fala, hayya ala al-fala. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. If you can make dua, you made a dua, Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wat al-tamma wa salat al-qa'ima. Ati Muhammadan al-wasilat wal-fadila wa al-tarajat al-rafi'a. Wa ba'asim wa qaram mahmud al-lazi wa'addah inna ka la tukhlif al-mi'ad. And in the sunnah, you make iqama on the left ear. So you turn the child in a way that you can have closeness to the left ear. Then you make the iqama by saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah. Qadi qamati salah. Qadi qamati salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Then you make the dua as well. Now, this is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, within authenticity, if I'm not mistaken, Shaykh al-Ban rahimahullah uh, had, made, uh, had made us to understand that making the Yaqama on the left uh, is a weak hadith. Wallahu alam, in any case, generally, this is what uh, we do. <clears throat> so these are the first words that the child should hear. It is the right of the child on you, the father, to make sure that the first words that will enter the ear are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and confirmation about the Prophet of Hud or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then calling to prayer and also calling to joy. And finally, you see, there is no God save Allah. Then the child is now given or transferred to uh, the mother. What we have to understand is that from that time, you the man or you the father, you start to know to do what is known as jihad. Jihad means to strive, to struggle. 
Now Allah had also made you to understand that you have been enriched with a child. It is not just a gift. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had made us to understand how important it is, so that we see that having a child is not only to bring happiness and joy, but rather the child or having that child may either be good or bad for you, depending on what Allah subhanahu wa taala had decreed. May Allah subhanahu wa taala make it easy for each and every one of us. Why I'm saying so is this, because you have carried a very big trust from Allah from the day the child is born. The child is born clean to believe in the oneness of Allah to always be answerable, accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. That is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kullu mawludin yuladu ala fitra. Every child is born on the nature of believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he continued, فَأَبَوَاهُ يُحَوِّدَانِهِ Then it is the parent who will either make him a Jew, aw yunasiranihi, or make him a Christian, aw yumajisanihi or they make him a worshiper of fire. He didn't mention that it is the father or the parent who will make him a Muslim because every child is born a Muslim. If even he's born to a, a, a non-Muslim family, until he gain maturity, he's a Muslim until he becomes whatever uh, he may like to come later or it's uh, been decreed on him. In any case, so this is also the responsibility of the father to make sure that the trust that you have taken from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you keep the child to be believer, believing in the oneness of Allah, that Allah is the only one, He is the creator, He is having the lordship, the one who sustains every creature in this world. It's Allah who has brought him into this world, and to Allah he shall return. Everything that comes to him from is from Allah, and anything that he loses or he misses in this world is also by the decree of Allah. And then there is only one by saying that La ilaha illallah. No one is worthy of worship but Allah. So the child is already prepared for the struggle. And that struggle is to strive and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only one without associating partners with Allah. It is your responsibility as a father. The mother had already played her role and still there she can assist you while you grow. What you have to understand is that Allah will ask you, the father, about the children. So whatever you have to understand is that whether you teach them or you make them to be taught, whatever the situation is, it is up to you, a responsibility of carrying on your head. <clears throat> then apart from that, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that every child come with his aqiqah. Aqiqah in Arabic comes from the word aqun, meaning that aqiqah is to sacrifice a lamb for the sake of the child that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had enriched you with. In any case, it is hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, you slaughter two lambs for the boy and one for the girl. And some may ask, why two and why one? Can I slaughter only one? Yes, you can. In the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned, it was mentioned that he slaughtered one each for his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein. He slaughtered one each for them. <clears throat> now this slaughtering, we have taken it to be very light, especially those who live in Europe and uh, Americas and other, some other places. Most of us, I'm not saying all, but most of us, the issue here is that uh, they say in these countries you cannot be it's not easy for you to slaughter even slaughtering is completely very difficult for you to do unless you had to go to uh, you know uh, those the butcher and tell him that okay I would like to you to slaughter for me and then he'll slaughter in the name of the child that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had enriched you with that's fine so uh, the least that you can do is to do this by making sure that the slaughtering is being made whether you do it yourself or is done down for you this is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, there is another saying that if you don't do it, then that will result to the child being ah. So aqiqa and aq are similar words, but opposite meaning. Here you are doing a sacrificing for the child, but in case you don't do, you are going to pay by the child growing and to be disrespectful. May Allah subhanahu wa taala forbid that. 
So it is the right of the child to come. If that you are not able to do for your own child, what is there again? You let him to grow before you start buying him McDonald's or you sending him to uh, you know, the restaurant, buying toys here and there, brother. That which is very important is to do the slaughtering. And the slaughtering in the sense that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you will divide the meat into three. That is what the Sunnah had already taught us in the sense of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So one third for you and your family, then one third for your friends, maybe neighbors, relatives, and the one third for your friends, I mean, for the poor. Now, in Europe, it's not everyone who would like to maybe take all these offers in case you may uh, present it to someone who is uh, in need. But in any case, you can at least make some food, especially it can be the source of you gathering brothers together uh, on a weekend instead of maybe the seven day that you're going to be able to do, then make sure that at least at a weekend, you can be able to organize yourselves, uh, do the slaughtering, leave some meat home for the mother and also the family, and also uh, what is left, you bring it, I mean, you, you, you prepare food and uh, make sure or you try that uh, every, so many hands will share this food. Then they will make dua, well, let me make baraka for your child. This is in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You are not going to lose anything, rather you are doing it to show that you are happy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessing you with a child. You see, this is when we talk of bid'ah uh, an explanation. Bid'ah means you begin, a start the word bada'ah, meaning that someone who has invented something that had not been done previously. So, this that we mentioned, the Nunda Akika, which is the celebrating of the, the birth of your child. People don't do this, rather they allow when their child is born, maybe they do anything, they, they, uh, you know, they buy some food here, I mean some drinks here, and then they say that it's over, nothing is done. Then when the child grow, you see them say, help me to celebrate the first birthday of my child, or like my child is now six years now, we're going to celebrate another day of my brother. Then cut flowers here and there, this has nothing to do with Islam. I'm not saying it's haram. Listen very carefully. This has nothing to do with Islam. What Islam has to do with you is what the Prophet had taught you, that you do immediately the child is born. Seven days, you have to do the slaughtering. If it's a male child, you circumcise. If you're going to be able to do all this in the, in the, in the seven days, because for instance, in, in countries, countries like Europe, you may be working. Sometimes the, the mother can be in a hospital. Sometimes there are some complications. The child will be in the hospital and so on and so forth. So you yourself will not be at peace. You can do it at, at a later time. So if it really should be after one month, that's not a problem. At, at least this is the time that you are able to do. So the slaughtering has to be done. The if in case, for instance, in these countries, for instance, it's not easy to, uh, to circumcise. Some of us have the possibility, uh, in, especially here in Finland, there is a Jewish man who does the, uh, the circumcision for most of the uh, Muslims who are born here in this country. Uh, the issue here is that this, the, the circumcision has to have to be done. The Jews are circumcised and also the Muslims circumcise. Uh, they do circumcise. Just as we can eat their meat because they slaughter in the name of Allah, so it is that they, they can also uh, circumcise uh, our children in case we don't have any Muslim to do that for us. So in any case, the circumcision is within the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the boys or the male. So uh, this is within the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The people went to the extent of talking about circumcision for the uh, for the girls as well. They say, okay, in Islam, they do circumcise the girl and the girls here and there. What you have to understand is that anything that had been the practice of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to be obeyed. But when he came, according to legend, he met people doing this. They, he asked them, why are you doing this for the girls? And then they said, to reduce, meaning that they to reduce the last in them, that uh, they could grow well and then get married and so on. In any case, they gave excuse. The Prophet ﷺ said that if you do it, don't do it too much, but rather it is part of the woman. Part of the woman in the sense that she also has to have that need uh, of, of, of having some love, I mean, some feelings in her. So Islam had come to discourage it, but not to encourage it. But in any case, today people are linked with Islam. In any case, that's not the uh, topic of today. Good. So you have taken the role of uh, 
uh, after the azan and the iqama, then the second thing is that you have made the aqiqah for your child. Now you are preparing the child for the future. That is the first stage, uh, sorry, the second stage of every human being. For the future, future in the sense that it is the second life we are living here in this world to an appointed time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayuha the insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadihan famulaqi. Oh human being, you are going to return to your Lord. Very much uh, confirmed, so prepare to meet Allah. So from the day you were born, you start preparing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from whom you came. What is preparation? The father had to train you. As we mentioned in the first hadith, the Prophet said, Kullu maulinu yuladu ala fitra. He is naturally a Muslim, so it is up to the father to maintain him a Muslim, make him grow to still believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He teaches him what is about Allah. He also teaches him about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and teach him about the deed. That these are the three most important things you have to understand, we all have to understand and learn. <clears throat> we learn uh, about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our creator is. We learn about the deen, which is the uh, deen of al-Islam. And then we learn about the messenger of the of, the, of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't only learn just like that, but rather we learn with proofs and evidence from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then at that time, we are ready for the world. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the surah Surah Al-Asr, where he says in the Quran, "Aaudhu billahi min al-shaytan rajim wa al-Asr in the insan al-fi khusr." Allah is swearing by time, the time of Al-Asr, and said, "Every human being is in a loss." In the Ladina Amun, unless those who believe, and after believing, Amilu Salihat, then after believing, they do good deeds with what they have learned or they have impacted into into, into uh, their, their minds. Then what our soul will have and they should always be on the way. Of the truth, what our soul is sabr, and we should always exercise patience. The truth, in the sense that when they had to practice this religion, then they have to spread it as well. And spreading the religion is not easy. You may have ups and downs, so you need to say the truth and finally exercise patience. So, with this stage, or from this stage, you try as much as possible to link your child to his Lord and link your child. Definitely, every father will prepare more. We are all prepared. Even the sometime before the child is born, we have prepared for him how he is going to acquire the world. We look for a school for the child. Why? Because we want him to grow one day and be somebody. But is that somebody that he will not stretch his hand to beg for anything? He will end up in the avenue attending a good school. After that, he had to also uh, be able to get a good job and then uh, be able to have a good life and continue as well. So in this regard, <clears throat> What you have to understand is that you prepare him for these two. The first is to know his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, uh, to who he is going to return. If he knows Allah, then he will know you. If he doesn't know Allah, he will not know you. These are the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. says in the Quran, وَقَدَ رَبُّكَ لَا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah decreed that he not to none should be worshipped but him. And then if you do that, then you show kindness to your parents. So uh, this is very, very important. Yes, you have to send him to a good school, prepare life for him and so on, but don't seize him or don't deny him of knowing who had created him. Then while we grow, brothers, sisters, and sisters, we have to understand we are not going to grow with our parents forever. We didn't do that forever. And the same thing applies to our children. They are not going to grow with their parents forever, meaning that they are going to live with their parents forever. One day you are going to leave home. Just as you have lived or you left the, 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 the home of your, uh, your parents, they are, you are, your children are also going to leave home one day. But you have to know, and this, we have to understand is that mostly when they are going to get married or when they get some job and they are doing or some school somewhere, then finally uh, it continues and one day they are going to marry. So within the stages of getting married, try as much as possible to assist your children as well. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that, Ya ma'ashara shabab, mani sata'a minkum al ba'ata faliyatazawwaj. Oh company of youth, any one of you who is having the capability should get married. So this is an encouragement from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, so the parents have to also try as much as possible to help the children. This is where sometimes problems do arise. Because a child 
of course, at a time when he becomes a man or a woman, uh, they would have to go and get married. Sometimes the decision is very difficult. He may only look at the cover of the book, but you would like you know more about what is inside the book. But you have to be very careful that you don't force your child into marriage because that is going to be his or her life. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even advised us not to force the girl into marriage. They ask him, saying, "Of Allah, then how do we confirm that she actually I would like to marry such and such man?" Then he said, "If you ask him whether he loves or he would like to get married to that man or that uh, um, uh, let's say uh, that gentleman, then uh, if he if she uh, affirms that is right." I mean, it's okay, then it means uh, she may be shy and may not be able to say yes or no, but you see some smile and some shyness in her. It means there is positive here. But if it's something she doesn't like, she now frowns her face and starts making some signs, that will show that actually she's becoming angry. So don't force her. Forcing her, you're going to get her into marrying someone she doesn't love. And that is very, very uh, negative. The same applies to the boy. So what you have to do is, while they go, try to be advising them the type of uh, people they. I mean, uh, man he has, she has to marry, and also the type of uh, woman she has to also marry. What you have to understand is, sometimes when we talk about quality, it is very important. There had been a time, <clears throat> time that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, let the rich marry the the rich, let the poor marry the uh, the poor. So it's like even the farmer married the farmer. Why? Because you are in different, different categories. You have to understand. If you are in different categories, this happened with to the to the uh, uh, adopted son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Zaid ibn Harisa, who said he wanted to marry. The Messenger of Allah said, "Who do you want to marry?" He said, "I want Zainab bint Jash." And then Zainab bint Jash is related to the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when she said, when the Messenger of Allah said, "You will get married to Zaid," she said, "No, I don't want him." He said, "You will marry him." Then she told him. Messenger of Allah, you love him, I don't love him. He said, she said, you have to. She said, I won't. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala interfered where he said, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنْ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَا مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنْ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَا إِذَا قَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ عَمْرًا أَنْ يَقُونَ لَهُمْ الْخِيَارَ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not allowed, but it's not befitting for a man, believing man or a believing woman, when Allah and his messenger had made a decree that they should also have an opinion. So at that time, she said, okay, if that is the case, you and Allah have decided, I agree. Then she went into the marriage, but the marriage couldn't work. But she always remind Zaid of his quality, a slave. You know, of course, he had been freed by, by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but since he had a stamp on him before, always she remind him about what he used to be. As we may say, she turned her night, uh, she turned his night into day, and his day into night. He couldn't feel happy in the marriage, so he himself went and told the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Messenger of Allah, divorce us. Messenger of Allah said, no, keep your wife. He said, no, I can't. In any case, we, 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 we uh, cut the story here. The issue here is that she was forced into marriage. She said, I don't want, but she was forced into it. And since it is not her will, finally, uh, she had to uh, get divorced. And actually, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was made to marry her. She was the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, married her to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, without any intermediary. When they come together, he was the wives of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, sometimes they also used to uh, sort of challenge their, their importance before the Prophet Muhammad. وسلم. So, Fatima radiallahu anha will say, My mother was the only woman. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam married when he didn't know any woman. Then Aisha radiallahu anha will say, "But I am the only wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who got married to him, and I've never known any man." Then Zainab bin Tijaj will say, "And I am the one who Allah married me to the messenger of Allah without any human intervention." So this used to be the qualities that they always remind one another. In only to show how important, uh, how important they were to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah. So the issue here is that you have to your children to get into marriage, uh, into into marriage, but don't force them, and make sure that you help them before 
and even while they are still married. This used to be the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anytime at all we will make reference to his grandchildren, it's he, the Messenger of Allah, who comes into the picture. Sometimes he carried them, sometimes he died, as if they were his direct children. Why? Because they were the children of his daughter. So in this regard, he had to make sure he's always seeing that peace is in the house. One of the most important things that he did was that his own daughter, Fatima radiallahu anha, came to complain to the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Messenger of Allah, my husband wants to take a second wife. I'm not against him, but the woman he wants to marry, I don't want her. Who is that? He said she want to, uh, he wants to marry the daughter of Abel Hakam. Abel Hakam means Abu Jahal. In any case, when Messenger of Allah heard about this, then he gathered the Sahara in, before, uh, you know, in giving introduction, and he said, Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, had complained to her father, as if he's narrating the story to them, complained to her father that Ali ibn Abi Talib, her husband, would like to take a second wife, and Fatima doesn't like that lady into her life. Now, it is up to Ali ibn Abi Talib to keep Fatima as the only wife at that time and not to marry the other lady. Or he married that lady and divorced Fatima. Walhamdu wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To show how a father had to stand by the side of his daughter. It is not haram for Ali to marry a second wife and whoever he wants. But the messenger of Allah being the father of Fatima Allah will also like to defend his daughter. This is an example for us to understand that we have to stand by our daughters, especially and even our children, I mean our, our, our sons, because marriage is a life, life commitment. You go in and be happy forever, or you go in and be sad forever. So in this regard, it is not befitting, especially in today's world, that you see the word divorce coming here, divorce coming there, brothers and sisters in Islam. Let's try to love one another for the sake of Allah. Do what Allah had commanded us to do. Pray for our children all the time. Be with them in every way of their lives. Not to put more pressure, too much pressure on them. And we have to understand that they are living in a different world, which is more different from how our world used to be. Meaning that our days are completely different from these days. So in order to be able to make things easy for them, Let's try to adapt the type of days in which they are living, and when that we can cooperate with them and make things more easy for them in this life. And then when we die tomorrow, they will also even like to Allah repay us by making to our for us that it will reach our graves. With this, inshallah, we have come to the end of today's lesson. We have gone through the stages of life and till uh when one had to get married inshallah if allah makes us to be within the living we may continue some other time until the end of the last stage of life with this inshallah i say anything that i said that was right is from allah and any mistake that i might, might have committed is from me or from satan may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgive us and overlook our faults may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all that i've said to be useful to myself and anyone who also hear what uh, the message that I've also uh, delivered from Allah and from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them have patience and make them have peace in their griefs. May Allah give them rahmah in their griefs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them their sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them be in Jannah. Brothers, sisters, all that have passed away, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them in the right way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them be in Jannah. And we also who are still alive, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us die on the way of Islam and end up in Jannah. Our children, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them be more better than us. May Allah keep them healthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them happy here in this world and also happy in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them more better than us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescue them from all evil. Those who are seeking to marry, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good spouses. Those who are married and they are seeking children, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them good children. Those who have children, they have problems with their children, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secure their problems. Those who are seeking anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be it in public or be it in secret, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them 
more than what they are requesting from Allah. May Allah straighten us unto the way of uh, Al-Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our sins. And with this, I say, Subhanakam Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.